Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. Today is our forward Sunday. You say, what does that mean? And uh, we're going forward for Jesus. Amen. And uh, I want to celebrate for a moment some of the things the Lord has done. When you came in today, you got a little outline, a little program, a little black one like this. It says forward on the front of it. I want to invite you to open it up. And on the left-hand side, you're going to notice that there are uh, uh, pictures. And I'm thankful for the history of this church, which was a church plan, and how God has moved over the years here amongst many folks. And I think about the first location at uh, West Alameda, 3440, and uh, currently it's the home to Whole Foods, man. How many of you have been over to that Chick-fil-A lately? Come on now, that's a line. Come on, it's good. And uh, get yourself some heaven on earth, come on. And um, you get over there, and a Sam just said, hey, man, Sam just got a job there. Wave your hand, Sam. Come on, man. Right there. Go see Sam, okay? Sam will hook you up with free milkshakes. You told me, right? The whole church. And uh, anyways, uh, uh, right there at the Alameda property, the Whole Foods stores there now, the Teleria. Uh, we were there doing church in a rented building. And, and we saw God do some incredible things, man. Those pews and that carpet is ugly. Let me just say that right now. But we saw God move in some incredible ways. Uh, we saw uh, Easter service over 500 people in church, three services. We saw so many lives changed in that baptistry that felt like you were the Pope way up there and uh, baptizing. I baptized a few hundred people in that waters of that baptistry, no exaggeration. I can think of so many lives that got dunked and bath buried in the likeness of his death and, 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 and risen to walk in the newness of life. And we celebrate what God did. And, and from there, uh, we got forced to uh, uh, go to uh, Pickwick Gardens. Man, I was joking with the early service. I said, man, I I can still smell the booze in the carpet uh, of Pickwick Gardens, you know, because they have parties there the night before. It's a banquet center. And uh, in the morning time, they try to clean it all up. But sometimes, you know, you'd have a beer bottle right there when you come to set up church right out there. And that was not the best thing at times. But uh, we were paying $3,500 a Sunday to do church there. And uh, incredible, incredible uh, times where we saw God move over a year and a half. And uh, we went to the Burbank Adult School and a church there. Uh, was meeting at Burbank Adult School, and we've tried everywhere to find a meeting location, and, and uh, so many schools uh, in L.A. are not open to churches being in their long term. You've got to really find a, a principal and a connection and administration that's willing to work with you, and uh, Burbank Adult School had a church there, and, and uh, the pastor of that church I talked with, they, they closed up due to financial hardship. They were a church plant, and um, called me and he said, hey, we're closing out of here. It might be a good opportunity for you guys to get in. And uh, we went there, lowered our cost a little bit. We did church there until, again, we were forced to leave there because they said we were too big. We were in the way. Uh, parking wasn't fit enough for us and all the excuses. I just felt like a redheaded stepchild. Remember that? And uh, we're getting tossed around. And, and then I think about the equestrian center. Come on, how many of you still smell the horses? Man, I'm just saying, that was a beautiful smell on Sunday morning out there. And some of you, <clears throat> even though you were told not to go over and touch the horse, you still went and did it, and uh, you probably got us kicked out. No, nah, I'm just joking. And um, we were at the equestrian center. We set up church there and tore down church. Our nursery was like 10 by 10. It was terrible. And, uh, but you know what? We opened up the word. We preached the gospel. We saw souls saved. We saw lives changed. We baptized people right there at the equestrian. We baptized people right at the Burbank Adult School. We baptized people right there at Pickwick Gardens. One of my daughters was, actually two of my daughters, one of them was baptized there, I think, and Lissy was baptized here. And, uh, and, and we saw God move in all of these locations. And then the the bottom picture is, uh, is the grand opening a little over a year ago here at 1110 South Victory. And we celebrate this location that God gave us. We understand it was a miracle. It was a move of God. If you want to know the whole story, I'll tell you over a cup of coffee. You invite me out. You pay. I'll talk, okay? Just joking. And, um, and uh, we, will, we will get some coffee and talk. But uh, God, God moved to get us in this location in an incredible way. And uh, we, we praise God for over 100 souls that have been saved at this building already. We praise God for dozens who We've gotten baptized. We praise God for dozens who have graduated one-on-one -on -one discipleship. We praise Jesus for, for the gospel transformation in lives week in and week out in these seats that so many of you purchased. And we understand 
a building is not the church. The people are the church. But what happens in the building is very important. That is where lives change. That is where, that is where souls are reached. That is where discipleship happens. That is where true community takes place week in and week out in corporate worship. And uh, we're thankful that God gave us a building. And let me just say, to those of you that have sacrificed in the years past, who some of you uh, have been there with us all the way through this, uh, I think about this top quote where it says, uh, He is no fool by Jim Elliott, who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. I think about Jim Elliott giving his life to reach an unreached uh, people group. And uh, I think about his wife, Elizabeth Elliott. She is who inspired us to name our second daughter, Elizabeth Elliott. And uh, incredible missionaries. And that's just a, uh, an awesome statement and quote there. And let me just say, everyone that has sacrificed, man, you were no fool for sacrificing. There are lives being changed. There are people being reached. There are lives being transformed week in and week out from the sacrifice of so many. I think about so many of you that, that went out there and week in and week out, man, how you set up church and Saturday nights getting there and loading the trucks up and going over there to Pickwick, man, and setting up for three hours and then, and then going, going to sleep and getting back a few hours later and getting there early and, and, and trying to rehook everything up. I remember times of, of of turmoil. I remember one time, man, we, we brought all the stuff over there and I get a phone call that they opened up the sound equipment. All of it was been stolen, you know, and that's always a blessing on a Sunday morning. At least the thief could have put a note there and notified us. And uh, I just think about so many oppositions. I think about so many that's the long hours and late nights. And, and I think about the demolition crews that came in here and we demolitioned my own hands, uh, uh, demolitioning this building and loading up dumpsters. And I think about uh, the blood, sweat, and tears that went in to the work to see this ministry get to where it is today. And we thank God for people who have sacrificed. We thank God for people who weren't just waiting for God to move, but they were willing to be the move of God. And we celebrate that today. We, we are thankful for that today. And every one of you, I don't take you for granted. We are in this together corporately, and we have seen God do some incredible things. I think about, I think about the times of prayer around this building for uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, man. We walked around this building 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There was somebody in this congregation congregation walking around the building praying on this ground sanctifying it to the Lord giving it to God saying God we ask you to move we ask you to bless how many of you are one of those people that walked around this building during that time just raise your hand nice and high I thank you guys for getting up early staying up late and just dedicating this ground as holy ground to the Lord where Christ's work will be done in LA for Jesus and we love it we celebrate it and I think about the best is yet to come and so many things have been experienced. So many things have been celebrated. So much money has been given. I think about the offering that we took at, at, at the uh, Alameda location where one offering, our first offering we took, $150,000. I think about... I think about the second offering we took at Pickwick Gardens, uh, $150,000. I think about uh, the Take That Mountain offering, which we prayed over this building for, and we had a whole service, and we didn't know what we were going to do. We didn't know if it was over, if we are going to give up, and together we came in about a half a million dollars together in that offering. So many saw God provide money either through maybe an inheritance, maybe a selling of a property, maybe a stock that did well for you or a bonus at work. We saw so many people come together and what we saw was a village a community a church say you know what we believe in a cause and the cause is people need Jesus and we're going to come together and we're going to get a church established in the city for the kingdom of God and we celebrate that we're thankful for all that God did during those offerings I think about the times of hardship we're just like God when are you going to how are you going to provide $3,500 a Sunday at Pickwick and $12,000 a month here for rent we we had to rent this for about two years before we ever used it because we had to have a lease before the city would begin the development process of giving us the rights to use this as a church and that whole process and then we got an approval and then we then we started construction and raised about a million dollars for construction in this place and just an empty vacant warehouse where uh, they used to make uh, uh, you guys remember the uh, bathing suits uh, uh, what are they called the um, the uh, bathing suits that they make uh, at the uh, they sell at Walmart man I forget the name of them now off the top of my head but it was a bathing suit 
fruit manufacture place right here. And then they use it to store like Ellen Show stuff and Warner Brothers. And, and I know a marijuana dispensary was trying to get in here. And uh, so many different stories. And uh, I think about this vacant building with shattered windows and so many things that God allowed us to do. And I thank you for your sacrifice. And I think about as the best is not yet to come yet. We are literally a church that is just going. We are a young church. We were a church plant. We are young. Uh, I like that that analogy of a snowball that begins to roll down the hill. And as it rolls, the snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, We are the move of God. We are moving and we believe truly the best is yet to come. And so as we go forward into 2019, what does God have for us as a church as we move? I'm going to give you a few things on the screen uh, in this forward presentation. Then we're going to open the word of God. Number one, here it is, additional services additional services. We thank God for growth. We thank God that uh, a year ago today, we have over 100 more people in church. We thank God uh, for a consistent pattern of people attending and friends and guests. So many of you, uh, you don't know me and I don't know you yet. I don't know your name. I apologize, all right? I forget my own kids' names sometimes. And uh, I'm trying my hardest to learn your names. And uh, some of you are very new here and you haven't even got to know me yet. I would love to get to know you. My wife would love to serve you. We'd love to minister to you in any way we can. And, uh, and we continue to see God add. And we celebrate that. We'll be adding additional services. We'll be adding a service uh, at 8.30 in the morning, our early service. We'll be adding a second English service at 10 a.m. We'll be adding a third service on February 24th at 11.30. The three service change. In addition to that, our Spanish service will be starting at 8.30 in the morning uh, in our teen room, our student ministry room, as they're just beginning as a church plant. And uh, it's exciting to see God continue continue to advance this church for the kingdom. Four services. Number two, I want to give you this one. Debt elimination. Debt elimination. We understand that as a ministry, uh, we have, we are in this building. God moved us in this building. We've raised a lot of money, but you know, we haven't completely paid for this thing yet. We thank God that we've got a a 20 year lease on this place. And, uh, but we have a real chance to be able to purchase this building and get this as an asset which is huge for a church of our of our of our of our age in LA and it's going to allow us to further the mission of starting churches and being a base with an asset that will only grow in equity and we thank God I'll share that in a moment number four number three is purchase Purchase City Light property. And uh, I just said that. And I think about, quick story, uh, we have a, 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 a lease on this. And uh, when we got the lease, uh, the lease price is $12,500 a month uh, for this facility, 12,000 square feet. And, uh, and, and, and what we didn't know, what the owner thought, is they thought they were going to get the tax benefit because the church is in here, so you don't got to pay property tax. And after we signed the lease, we went down to file the paperwork, and the, the, the city uh, uh, assessors said, uh, the L.A. County assessor says, no, uh, that has to benefit the church. And uh, so then our went from 12.5 to 10.5 without us even knowing. Man, that was God right there. I'll tell you right there, man. There were so many God moments like that. And, uh, but here's the thing. The building is a prayer for 3.6 million and uh, it, it's an investment property because the sale the church goes with the sale so whoever gets it they, we still have to be in that lease the guaranteed lease and so uh, it sets the price the lease price sets the price of the building because an investor says hey if I'm going to put 3.6 then I expect to get a percentage back on my investment well the rent return is not good enough for a 3.6 million dollar investment uh, and so she's tried to sell this thing so many times three times since we've been in it keeps on getting pulled off the market she's come to us and she's begging us to buy it she says I'll carry the equity I mean I'll carry the down payment if I got to a portion let's get this thing done and uh, we we have a chance to get this uh, at, at a good price uh, that will be an incredible opportunity for future ministry and uh, we believe in trusting God for that number four is we want to prepare to launch our first church plant we have a vision for reaching LA. We don't want to become a mega church where we just keep on building, building, building. We want to be a healthy church, multiple services, real community, but we want to constantly be a sending church where we are sending 
people into cities in LA, two cities we're praying over is Culver City and San Fernando City. And we're asking God to give us a church in those cities. And we are preparing by seeing young men uh, grow and become pastors and ordained and seeing a leadership teams formed and getting ready to, to partner with some networks where we'll have uh, some more networking and more assets at our disposal to be able to start these churches. I'll tell you right now, church, LA is a mission field. LA's a mission field. Amen's a good thing to say right there. Some of you are being real quiet. LA's a mission field. LA's a place where people need the gospel. And if you're a partner here, uh, I hope you understand when we say LA needs the gospel, if you're a member, that's a good spot to say amen. Because we're partners together here. What are we doing here, church? So we're called to reach LA. Amen. We have a mission field here. Amen just means I agree. You know that? It's not that hard to say. Let's all say it. Ready? Amen. That's all that means, man. All it means. And uh, some of you women, I know your husbands say that you talk a lot. It's okay for you to say amen in church, all right? Come on now. And uh, just joking. And anyways, move on. And so we, are, we, are, we have a vision. We have a calling as a ministry to reach LA for the gospel. And let me just say right now, this is all of us together, a call upon all of our lives to reach our city for the gospel. And we're asking God for this thing uh, to begin to prepare. As we pray, you pray with me. You say three ways, three ways that I can be involved. What are the three ways? And I'll say this right now. You say, well, why do I gotta be involved? I just wanna come and sit and stare at you on a Sunday morning and not say amen. And uh, why do I gotta be involved? What, what is this about? Let me remind you right now, church, this is not Nick's church. This is our church. God has placed me here with a calling in my life and a spiritual gift uh, as a call to be a pastor and a spiritual gifts uh, that, that facilitate that call as a pastor. God has put those on my life. And God has led me to be in this role at this church. My future is all about City Light. I have no checkout date. I have no time of this is when I'm gonna leave. It, it is here, our family's here. We are called to the mission of reaching LA with the gospel. That's my role. But let me tell you right now, we are, that's my spiritual gift in this church as a pastor. I look forward to the day where we got plurality of pastors and, and ordaining more men that we sense the call of God in their life and have the spiritual gifts to be pastors where we see that continue to grow in our ministry and, and, and pray with us on that. But, but, but one thing right now is you and I all have a role here at this church. We all have a, a, a spiritual gift. We all have a calling upon us. And this is, our, this is our mission together as a church to reach LA with the gospel. It's not one man's church. It's my job to cast vision, to give oversight, to be a bishop, elder, shepherd to our congregation. But it's the, it's the church's job to use their spiritual gifts, their callings as we facilitate and as we build the kingdom through our local church here in LA. And so three ways that you can be involved, I'm going to give them to you right now. Number one, here it is on the screen, pray. I'm going to ask everyone here that you would pray, that we would bathe this over prayer as a congregation. That we'd say, God, we're going to partner in prayer together. We're going to ask God, God, that you would move upon this place. I think about a miracle where God provided almost a half a million dollars in the Take That Mountain campaign. About 800000 overall in a year and a half. We thank God for that, man, that God did that. But I'll tell you right now, that wasn't just a coincidence. That was prayers being answered. That was prayers being answered. That was people praying to God. And that was God providing the funds for people. That was God providing the inheritances, the bonuses, the, the stock growth, whatever it was that allowed them to give. That was God. And, and God answered the prayers where he moved on the hearts of his children to give. God moved upon our congregation. Man, that was revival we were experiencing. And we're going to pray that God would continue to raise a church of extravagant givers. A church that never stops praying the prayers that scare you when you say them. The prayers where you ask God to do what only God can do. A prayers that expand even your Excel spreadsheet or your budget sheet. I mean, prayers that you say, I got no clue how this is going to happen. But God, I promise you, if you give it, I will make a way. And you're going to see God blow your mind when he shows you that he's not some distant deity. But he's a God that hears you and wants to answer the prayers you give. 
I thank God for June down here at our men's breakfast yesterday, which was a phenomenal time. I'd encourage you, if you're a man, to come on out to our men's breakfast, man. We love them. And uh, our men's nights as well. And June got up and shared about prayer. And I'm thankful I was messing in the early service. June right here, 61 years old. Man, you're a cool 61-year-old, man. Come on, man. Where's a beanie to church? That's cool right there. And, uh, and June right there, I'm thankful he's a senior saint. That's crazy. He would be, I guess, a senior saint. And uh, he's a golden years. I don't know if that's right or not, but a senior saint for sure. And, uh, and I'm thankful for a man that gives wisdom, that loves Jesus, that loves his wife, that loves his daughters. And I'm thankful for his influence and mentorship here. And uh, he shared with our church about how we need to be a church of prayer. And all prayer is is an honest conversation with God. You don't got to have eloquent words and be able to articulate everything uh, like you think they got to be. It's you just talking to God, opening up a conversation and letting him talk back to you. We need to pray. He also shared that prayer is one of the deepest forms of worship. And I've been chewing on that. And I think it's so powerful and such a, a good statement. And then thirdly, he talked about why do we pray? Because there's a real God in heaven. And I thank you for that wisdom, June. And I'll tell you right now, church, we need to understand that. We need to be a church that gets on our face, that, that, that talks to this real God, and that asks God to do things that we can't imagine. Ask God to move in ways that we can't even dream of. So I'm asking us as a church to pray. Number two, I'm asking you as a church to attend and serve. To attend and serve. I want to encourage you right now, if you're a partner of City Light, we call our membership partnership. If this is your church, you say, that's my pastor, this is my church, I want to challenge you to go forward and move forward in your attendance habits. I want to encourage you to be more consistent in your attendance habits. It is so hard sometimes to track some of our partners because they're like Casper the Friendly Ghost. You don't know where they are every now and then they pop up on social media. And I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you that you would not be Casper, okay, but that you would be more like Christ, that you you would be this cornerstone, that you would be consistent in your attendance, in your habits. And you say, you know what? That's my church, man. Hell or high water, I'm going to be there, man. That's the place where I get fed. That's the place where I eat. That's the place where my kids are discipled. That's the place where I build the kingdom in my mission field. That's my church. But I also want to encourage you to serve. Don't just come and sit, come and serve. I was telling my daughter Amy down here with my wife on the front row this morning, I said, make sure you get to church, you find something to do. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, because we don't go to church just to sit, we go to church to serve. And uh, this is a place where we use our spiritual gifts. And I haven't exactly identified what Amy's spiritual gift is or what Lissy's spiritual gift is. Both of them have the Holy Spirit. They got saved. They got baptized. The moment you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. He gives you a spiritual gift. That's what the Bible teaches. And, and, and both of them have that spiritual gift being grown. And I want to see these kids use those in their local church. You ought to want to see your kids do the same. You ought to want to see your family do the same. Use their spiritual gifts in the local church. Use their talents in the local church. Hey, you have a talent. You have a spiritual gift. Some of you got something, and you got something that God said, I gave you that. I ordained it. I anointed it. I, I, I've given you that in your life. Now use it to build the kingdom. And I've given you a card inside of your, inside of your forward handout that says the forward, uh, forward com uh, or commitment card, excuse me, commitment card. There's two of them, but look at the one that just says commitment card. Uh, on it, has got a name, phone number, and email. And what I want to challenge you to do right now, my, what, what's my, how can I help? Pray. Number two, attend and serve. I want to challenge you right now, if you go to the 845 service, if you would commit, and you're at the 11 today, but you, I'm just telling you, just in case this is like a, a fluke that you're here, okay? If you go to the 845 usually, I want to challenge you to go to the 830 service. I want to encourage you to make that your service. If you go to the 11 o'clock service, I want to encourage you to make it your 1130 service, your service. And I'm going to tell you something right now that may shape that, that why behind that. Number one, we are going to have a service times of an hour and 15 minutes, and everyone says amen. Come on now. That's a good place to say amen. And uh, Kim, you're going. I'm just going to say good night. And, uh, and so we understand that, that it may sound like three services, but in all reality, you're going to be at church the same length of time because our time usage is going to be very well. In the back, they've got blow darts. And right when it hits an hour and, and, and like five, they're going to shoot a blow dart, and it's going to hit me right here, and that means I'm done, all right? And uh, they're going to train me, okay? They're going to train me. And, uh, and so hour 15, we will be done. And uh, so that means 8.30 gets done at 9.45. 
okay? And, and, and that means 10 gets done at 11.15. That means 11.30 gets done at 12.45. Right now, our 11 o'clock service gets done at 12.45. You're like, dang, I shouldn't have come today, all right? And, uh, but anyways, uh, uh, typically sometimes we're earlier. But I'm saying same length of time, same length of time. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is, is, is you come to the 8.45, pick the 8.30 to attend. And then if you're, if you're attending the 8.30, pick to serve in the 10. If you come to the 11, pick the 11.30 to attend. And if you come to the 11.30 to attend, pick the 10 to serve at. You're going to be here the same length of time regardless because of our service time structure. Encourage that. You say, how long does this commitment go? I'm afraid of commitment. I know. I know. Most people are, right? And uh, I, I don't get to give a time limit. I, I, I would suggest about six months you'd make this commitment. I'm going to attend this service six months. That's what I'm going to do as we free up the 10 o'clock service for guests. Here's what statistics show right now. All of this is based, a lot of studies, 10 o'clock service is the number one prime hot service for attenders in the United States. Number one, you get to sleep in, okay? And uh, number two, you get out before lunchtime, all right? So it's a good service to go to. We want to be missions-minded and say we want to give our best service, uh, I guess you could say time-wise, to those guests that aren't yet here. So we make room with our parking, with our facilities, with everything so we can smoothly operate on Sundays. You may say, listen, I want to attend the Spanish service. How many of you speak Spanish here? Raise your hand, Roja. You speak Espanol, okay? All right, right there, man. Good job. That's a lot of people right there. In the first service, our Spanish pastor was in here, and I told him to look around and mark the people that raised their hand, okay? And, uh, and I want to encourage you right now. If you speak Spanish, you have an automatic opportunity to go out into L.A. and lead so many people to Jesus that speak only Spanish. I'm telling you right now, church, I'm not concerned as much about Spanish people le learning English as I am about Spanish people needing Jesus. We can have a mindset that says, well, they're in America. They need to speak our language. Uh, listen, man, I'm, I'm going to step off of my self-righteous pedestal, and I'm going to say, no, I'm going to become all things to all men like Paul did. I'm going to become all things to all men. I'm going to contextualize and reach people where they are. Listen, I I I'm just saying, right now, we've got to reach people who are in our country. Right now, they're in our country. Whatever language they speak, we need to learn it. We need to develop it. We need to understand them, and we need to go reach them. And you might say, you know what? Listen, I'm going to go to the 830 service. 130 for Spanish has been hard for some of you. We're helping you. Attend the 830 Spanish. Some of you say, well, I don't want to go to Spanish because, and then I miss out on English. Well, how about you go to 830 Spanish and then come to the English also? Too much Bible is not going to kill you. Right. <laughs> I mean, you eat a lot of carbs. That will kill you. You drink soda, that will kill you. Too much Bible will not kill you. And so you say, well, I'll come and I'll go to the 8.30 Spanish. I'll, I'll serve in the 10 and I'll attend the 11.30. You know what's cool about that? If you're used to coming right now at 8.45 and 11, serving and attending, you're going to be here the same length of time. And so today you say, I'm going to make a commitment on this card, my name, my phone, and my email. I'm going to sign up for the services, and then I'm going to drop it in the drop box. We're going to email you, let you know we got it. We're going to form a spreadsheet of those who have committed to be in what service, because you're going to help us in those services facilitate and, and build and reach our city for Jesus Christ. We love it. Number two, number three, I want to give you this one, give, give. Now, now, I just saw some of you cringe right there, okay? And you're going to the pocketbook now. And uh, I want to I encourage us as a church to give. I want to list a few things we're going to give towards right now. Number one, we have our loan number one. We have five loans right now. Loan number one, 27322 Loan number two, 29543 Loan number three, 40291 Loan number four, 70,606. Loan number five, our largest one, $418,537. Again, we raised about $800,000. We spent about a, a half a million just paying rent before we could ever even move into this building for our first service. I'll tell you right now, uh, uh, you know why so many church plants are failing in LA? Because it's expensive. Since, since I've been here, I've heard of almost a dozen church plants that have closed their doors. Because starting something is expensive. But I'll tell you right now, L.A. needs more churches. You say, well, I see a lot of buildings. Just because there's a building doesn't mean there's a church in there. Doesn't mean they're actively reaching people. And I'll tell you right now, what we need more than anything is people being reached. Estimated 17 million people in L.A., L.A. Metro. That is massive. And what's crazy about L.A. is it has the opportunity to change the whole world. We have 30 nationalities right here in our own congregation. Think about those 30 nationalities talking about Jesus in their own language to their own people and their country through Facebook, through social media, through FaceTime. Folks, we are reaching the world just by reaching L.A. This is a mission field that God has given us here with our church. And we have a responsibility to fulfill that. 
And I'm excited as we move forward. And, and there's no doubt, it's expensive. And we've stepped out by faith in a lot of the area. And every dime has been spent wisely. I personally have, have, have gotten blisters and pulled all nighters. My wife personally painted the signs on the front of our building. Many of this building has pers- personally been touched by myself and my wife and a few others at our church. I'll tell you right now, we did not just get frivolous. I worked myself to the ground to get this thing open. And so I want to tell you right now as a church, we've stewarded, we've prayed, but we've got a responsibility. Number one, some of these loans are on personal people's assets at our church that have stepped up in this area. And we have a responsibility to them. Uh, we, we have an opportunity to move towards purchasing this building, but we've got to free up cash flow. What we will do when we pay off loans one through four is we will free up $3,000 a month in loan payments. Right now, 48% of our budget goes towards this building and loan payments. 50 cents of every dollar, 48 cents of every dollar goes to pay for either this building's rent, the utilities, or our loan payments. We're going to cut $3,000 a month off of our deal, which is going to allow us to go quicker towards debt elimination and also be freer in operating the church to do more for the kingdom and, and, and expanding the gospel. And so we have an opportunity here to do some incredible things. The way we're going to do this is, is the goal we need to raise, I don't know if I gave you guys that number, is $170,000. 170. And you say, Pastor, that sounds like a lot of money. I'll tell you right now, I've, we saw God 150 at our first offering at the old building, uh, a smaller church than this. We saw God do 150 again at Pickwick. We announced it a few weeks later, 150 came in. Uh, we saw God do a half a million uh, in March 3rd, 2017. So many people gave tens of thousands of dollars, and some gave a thousand, some gave two, some gave five, some gave ten, some gave fifty, some gave a hundred. God just moved on hearts. That number may look big, but when everyone does their part, you'll be amazed at how quick that number comes up. It is amazing when everyone does something, how that number can be fulfilled. On April 7th, it's on the bottom of your handout, we are going to have the Forward Sunday offering. And we're praying that God would move in our church for a one-time cash offering. And wouldn't it be amazing just to see God do that? Amen! Some of you partners ought to say right there. And uh, it'd be amazing to see God provide that money right there. And the freedom that would give to a ministry in L.A. And, uh, and I think about also the commitment card you have inside of your program right here. This commitment card right here will also be turned in on that Sunday to those that choose to participate. Above my tithe and above my missions. Above my tithe and above my missions. 10% my missions. Above that, I'm going to give monthly to debt elimination. If we can see 170,000 go to paying off the loans one through four and also see another few thousand come in for debt elimination, that's going to continue to allow us to put more and more on that 400 until we can figure out a way to, pull, uh, uh, to purchase this building and maybe roll that 400 into this building. We're not exactly sure right now, but I do know this. We've got to be willing to step out by faith and be the move of God. We've got a calling. We've got an opportunity to see God move. And here's what I'm going to ask you. I know this. When you begin to pray that God would provide the money to give, because so many I think you do want to give. When you begin to pray that God would provide the money, I would challenge you for two months just to pray. God, give me the overtime. God, give me the, give me the bonus. God, give me the extra Uber hour or something. I don't know. God, God, allow me to get back more of my taxes. And I thought, God, would you provide it? And I'll tell you right now, when you make that prayer to God and say, God, will you provide this? And God, if you provide this, then God, I will be willing to give it back to you. I'll be willing to give it back to you. It's amazing. Recently, my family downsized and moved into an RV just to be more stewardship with our finances and save for our future. And uh, we have four kids living in a 300-square-foot RV. And uh, it's really cool. You may think it's weird. Go, go search us online, all right? And uh, you'll be amazed at the tiny house movement right now. And, uh, and so it's unique, but it's something God called us to for this time in our life. And, uh, and, and we sold everything we owned, but yet a few pairs of underwear, thank God we kept those, and a few socks and some jeans and shirts. And it's amazing. Selling everything we owned, we saw $5,000 go out the doors in a few days through, through Facebook sailing and offer up and let go and all that stuff. It's amazing. And you know what? I don't miss one item we sold. I don't miss one item we sold. I don't want to make memories with things. I want to make memories with people. I don't miss one item I sold. I'm not going to be able to take that precious heirloom to heaven or that gym we found. I'm not going to be able to. And I'm going to challenge the church. If you say, you know, let me get creative. Let me be intentional. Let me be strategic. Let me make a decision and say, God, if you'll provide it, I'll give it. And if we'll make a decision, church, right now to, to pray that prayer and see what God will do. Are we in? Let's do it, church.
I'm excited about the future. And I pray, I pray that because of this, we'll continue to see God expand the ministry. Open your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. If you were coming to the uh, 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 services, all right, you'd already be out, okay? And we go to three services, all right? So uh, I got a few more Sundays. Nehemiah chapter 1, okay? Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to talk through Scripture together for a moment. Nehemiah is an Old Testament passage, an Old Testament passage. And what I want you to see today is that God, God has a call on your life. It's bigger than the 9 to 5. It's bigger than owning the home. Nothing wrong with the nine to five, nothing wrong with owning the home, nothing wrong with driving the nice car, nothing wrong with saving for retirement. Those are all things that God leads you that are wise. But I'll tell you right now, the calling of God upon our lives is much bigger than the nine to five. When you were saved, God chose you, God called you, and God gifted you with a special calling and a special gift. We live those out first and foremost in our local church. We are the body together in a local church building the kingdom and in Nehemiah chapter number one we see the call that God put on someone's life his name was Nehemiah Nehemiah chapter one verse one verse 11 the Bible says this the words of Nehemiah the son of Hekaliah in the month Kislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa the palace Hanani one of my relatives and some men of Judah arrived So I asked them concerning the returning Jews who had been in captivity and concerning Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant that returned from captivity is there in the province and during great affliction and reproach. Let's pause for one moment. You say, where is he at? What is he he talking about? If you know anything about the Old Testament, uh, the, the children of Israel were in bondage in Babylon for many years. That's where we see Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That is where we see so many stories of our Old Testament. We see the prophet Haggai writing his book during that time, Ezra recording them being released. And and, and, and the Babylonians captured and destroyed the temple that Solomon had built in Jerusalem. And uh, and, and in in about uh, 500-ish BC, King Cyrus of Persia came and defeated the Babylonians. And King Cyrus made a decree that the Jews could go back to their homeland and rebuild the temple. Now what happened when they got there is many of them got distracted. Many of them, uh, as Ezra writes, or Haggai, the prophet, wrote to them, they went and they dwelt in their sealed houses and they neglected the work of God. God released them for a purpose and many of them got distracted because of life. And life happens. Let me tell you something, I'm in the thick of it right now. All right, I know my four daughters have not started their time of the month yet, okay, forgive me, but I'll tell you right now, their emotions all hit, it seems like, at the same time uh, together, and it's like an emotional drama case. Then on, add on top of that, okay, a toddler, I'll tell you, toddlers are like little demons, okay, and, uh, and wrapped in human flesh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and we got the tears, and we got the emotions, and I, and we got, I think my wife is so patient with teaching these women about, about womanhood, and how to balance life and emotions, and all that stuff, and, and, and just the, the crying, and everything that goes into play, it's, it's, it, I'll, I'll you, bills, uh, work, uh, anxiety, attacks of Satan, all the warfare. We can get sometimes lost in it all. And the children of Israel, they got delivered and they got lost in it all. And we find here that, that, that now Nehemiah gets word. Nehemiah is in Persia. He's the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Now these are all documented leaders, history, we'll talk about them. King Artaxerxes was a leader in Persia in the late 400s BC, before Christ. And uh, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. You say, what is that? Basically, Nehemiah went everywhere with King Artaxerxes. And what he did is he tasted, he tasted the cup before the king would drink it to see if it had been poisoned. And so anything, so wine, juice, everything, water, everything the king would taste, first Nehemiah would taste it. And uh, everywhere the king went. So Nehemiah gets word from his family in, in Persia, uh, in, the, in the king's palace, that the Jews in Jerusalem are in bondage. That the walls are decayed, the city is decayed, the temple's not being rebuilt, they're in slavery, they're worshiping idols, it's a mess. And Nehemiah gets a burden for reaching those people. Let's keep on reading. 
Also, the wall of Jerusalem remains broken down, and its gates have been burnt with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. Then I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenants and mercy for those who love him and keeps his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant. He goes to God, just praying for God to move, which I now pray before you day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I love how Nehemiah recognizes that the problem wasn't just others' problem, it was also his own problem. He uses the word, we have sinned against you. He acknowledged that his people were broken. The people needed revival. They were in bondage, but he confessed that he was also part of the problem. You know, it's so easy to sit back as self-righteous Christians sometimes and point the finger at everyone else for the problems in our country. But you know what I want to encourage us, church, is to turn that finger and point it at our own head right here. We want, we want to talk about all the negativity going on. And listen, I, I'm not for keeping it silent. I think we ought to uh, approach injustices and, and stand up for those things. But I'll tell you right now, more than anything, we ought to say, where can I get right with God? And Nehemiah owns up to his own self. And he says, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not obeyed the commandments nor the statutes nor the judgments which you commanded your servant Moses. Please remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you behave unfaithfully, then I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my, fa- my fa- uh, fa- farthest part of, uh, and, and return to me, command do them through your outcasts are under, I lost there, through your outcasts are under the farthest part of heaven. I will gather them from there and bring them back to the place where I've chosen to establish my name. Now these are your servants, your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I implore you, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. And uh, let me find my spot there, man. My iPhone, my, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. Maybe I'm 61. I need glasses. And uh, uh, your servant and your people, whom you have redeemed by your greatest power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I implore you, let your ear be attended to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name. And let your servant prosper this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cup bearer. So we see here, uh, 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 Nehemiah got burdened for reaching people. Nehemiah was Jewish. He saw that his people were in Jerusalem and he saw that there was a need and he took it upon himself to say, you know what? I'm, I, you know, how many of you think Nehemiah was probably comfortable living in the king's palace? Everywhere the king went, all the meals the king ate, all the fine wine and the drinks and everything, uh, right there, uh, the feather top mattresses. I mean, he would have had the job that everyone else dreamed of having. I mean, I think about how many selfies we would have been taking with the king if we had that job. I mean, he had it made. He had it made. And when he got the word, that there was a need, that his people were in bondage. He thought, you know what? I either have a choice. Am I just going to enjoy the comfort of my life? Or am I going to get up and use my life for a purpose greater than me? And you know, that's ultimately the heart of the gospel right there. The gospel says, let me lay my life down for you so you can have life. Man so often says, let you lay your life down for me. That's the heart of abortion. Let you lay your life down for me so I can have life. Totally contrary of the gospel. And church, we have a calling on us. We have a purpose for us. We've been placed here in LA for a reason. God sovereignly has put my soul in a male body and your soul in a male or a female body. God has placed us where we're living for a reason. And I look at America and I look at our land and you know what I say? Can I just sit back and live my life in ease and comfort? Or am I willing to get up from the king's palace, my comfort, my things, my ease of life and pursue a purpose that is greater than me? And that's ultimately the decision that Nehemiah had. And we're going to see in chapter number 2, verse 1, in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. 
Never had I been upset in the presence. So the king said to me, why is your face troubled, though you do not seem sick? This is nothing but a troubled heart. He's burdened. Then I became very much afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should not my face be troubled when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates have been destroyed by fire? He goes, why should I just sit back and enjoy my life when there's a need out there? When there's people that need to be reached? You know, I think about that question so much. What am I going to enjoy in my life and just live ease when there's people that need to be reached? There's a purpose and a calling that God has called us to. There's a calling upon my four daughters' lives. There's a calling upon my wife's life. There's a calling upon my life. And I'll tell you right now, it's bigger than the nine to five. It's bigger than the nine to five. And he keeps on writing here about this. So the king said to me, uh, live for why should not my face waste and his gates have been destroyed the fire? So the king said to me, why are you what are you requesting about this matter? Immediately, uh, immediately I prayed to the God of heaven and then said to the king, if this pleases the king and if this might be good for your servant who is before you, then you would send me to Judah to the city of my father's tombs so that I may rebuild it. The king with the, with the queen sitting beside him said to me, how long would you, how long would your journey be? When are you getting back? When are you going to return? Because it pleased the king to send me. I established a timetable for him. I further said to the king, if this pleases the king, may letters be given to me for the governors of the province beyond the rivers. He's asking, you know, God put him there and he has this connection. So he's, he's using his connections, right? Can I get letters now so I can get through these provinces so that they would allow me to pass through until I come to Judah? as well as a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. That must have been a bad dude right there. That he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the temple mount. So now the king is going to help fund the rebuilding of this wall for the city wall and for the house into which I will enter. The king granted me these things because the good hand of my God was upon me. When I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, I gave them the king's letter. He also sent with me commanders of foot and horse and soldiers. The king then gave Nehemiah's soldiers to go with them. When Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, subordinate, heard this, it deeply grieved them that there was a man coming to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. There's always the God haters out there. I'll tell you right now, Satan doesn't want LA to be reached. Satan doesn't want you to bring the gospel to your school. I think about Kim reaching people in her school for Jesus. Satan doesn't want a Bible club going on at Hoover High School. Satan doesn't want you to speak up for the injustices in our land. Satan doesn't want you to share the gospel with people. People are going to say church just needs to shut up and be quiet. Because ultimately Satan wants to blind the eyes of those that do not see so they cannot see light. And we see here that, that there's opposition, but we see that Nehemiah is willing to pursue the purpose upon his life. And I'll tell you right now, man, my burden for, for shepherding our church and in my decades here, and the churches will start and the ministries will build, our heart as a husband and wife is that we would inspire people to understand who they are in Christ, their identity, and that they would fulfill the mission and calling of God upon their life. So many lives are wasted doing the meaningless. When you face that last final moment of your life and you take that last breath, I don't want to be there in that time of regret. Thinking, why did I live so selfishly? Why did I just live for me? No, I want to now pursue a life and a calling. And I want to inspire our church to understand that we can either pray for a move of God or we can be the move of God. So often we pray for God to move in our country and God says, well, I'm waiting for you to move because you've got me living inside of you. We pray for the Holy Spirit of God to show up in our workplace and, and, and heal and do a work. And God says, well, I'm just waiting for you to do the work. You already got the Holy Spirit with you. We can't just sit back and pray for God to move. Are we serious about stepping out and moving? The history of our church and the purpose of Forward Sunday is that we would own the calling of God in our life. We would own the purpose of God in our life. And we would not just approach it as the nine to five, but we'd say, no, I'm going to step out by faith and I'm going to not just pray for a move. I'm going to be the move. 
And you may sit back and say, but I'm so underqualified. I don't have enough. I've got too much baggage. I'm thankful that the gospel qualifies the unqualified. I'm thankful that the gospel gives me a spiritual gift and anything I do is not my own ability, but is the spiritual gift and Holy Spirit that's flowing through my life. You may feel like you're not good enough. You may feel discouraged and disillusioned. Those are tricks of Satan upon you in your life. God has a purpose for you. In your mother's womb, the prophet Jeremiah said, he knew you because you're alive in the womb. You're a life. He formed you in that womb, the prophet Isaiah said. He had a calling on your life in that womb. Your parents may have said you were an accident, but you weren't an accident to God. God put you on this earth for a reason. You're not just taking up space. You have a reason. God placed Nehemiah in the king's palace for a reason. Let me say right now, God has given you your career. God has given you your influences. God has given you your networking for a reason. Are you using those things for God or for yourself? That's a powerful question. Nehemiah was comfortable with the dream job. You say, well, it really was a dream. He was drinking cup, you know, and could have got poisoned. Yeah, but he was living in the palace. He got to probably drink a lot of things that no one else got to drink. He probably got to eat a lot of flame and yawn that no one else got to eat. He probably got to sleep. He got to travel. Anywhere the king went, he went. He had the job, the cool job, man. A guy gets to travel with so-and-so. And he could have thought, well, man, do I just do this myself? Or do I use my network, my career, my calling in life? Do I use all of those things to reach people? And what's amazing is his network and the king ended up funding him the, 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 the building material, ended up giving him the supplies, gave him the soldiers, gave him the letters to pass through the forest, gave him the opportunity he had. I'll tell you right now, if you just say today, God, I want to use my life for you. God, you have a purpose for my life. God, the gospel says I'm called. The gospel says I'm chosen. The gospel says I'm anointed. The gospel says that God has a path for me to walk in. God has a purpose for my life. Life. The devil will say, oh man, you're just wasting time. You screwed up too much. Just pursue this life for yourself. But God say, no, I've anointed you. I've called you. I've chosen you. I've given you something that others need. I want to give you number one. We have a purpose. Nehemiah had a purpose. My question to you is, is do you know what your purpose is? And I'll tell you right now, your purpose is bigger than the nine to five. Your purpose is bigger than buying the house one day. Nothing wrong with that. Your purpose, though, is bigger than just saving up for retirement. Nothing wrong with that. Your purpose on earth is bigger than that. Your purpose is even bigger than being a mom. My purpose is bigger than being a dad. My job with my four girls is to disciple them to become like Jesus. Same as my job at here at City Light. Same as your job as a Jesus follower, to make disciples. We got to view our family, our resources and everything. How can I use this for God's purpose? Do you know your purpose or are you living selfishly? Nehemiah saw that there is a purpose upon his life. He pursued that purpose. And then notice in verse number 11 of Nehemiah chapter number two. When I arrived in Jerusalem, I was there three days. Then I rose in the night, and I few men who were with me. Thank God you got partners with him, amen? I told no one what may God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem, probably because they would have got scared. There was no animal with me except the one on which I rode. So I went out by night by the valley gate toward the dragon's wall and then to the dung gate because I was inspecting the broken down walls of Jerusalem and its burned gates. Next I passed by the fountain gate and then to the king's pool, but there was no place for my mount to pass. By going up along the riverbed at night, I inspected the wall. Then I turned back so that I could enter the valley gate and then came back. The officials did not know where I went or what I did since I had not yet told it to the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or to any of the others who would do the work. Finally, I said to them, you see the distress that we are in? Hey, church, do you see the distress that our country's in? Is anyone with me or are we zoned out? Come on, man. This is a corporate worship here. 
not a, I'm not lecturing you in a seminary class. We're together in this thing. We're amen and truth. Amen, Will? Amen. amen. Corporate worship. When you look at our city, do you see a need? When you look at Hollywood, do you see a need? Kim, when you look at your school, do you see a need? Anywhere we look, there's a need, church. I think about when me and my wife were praying about coming to L.A., we were praying about Oregon or Washington. The clouds kind of detoured me a little bit. <laughs> but as we were flying into L.A., and as we saw the lights, and the skyline is incredible. And we owned a home in Arkansas, and we had a comfortable job at a church. And we thought about, God, are you calling us out here? We were afraid. We were scared. But we knew the need of L.A., we knew the need of Hollywood. When others around the country make fun of Hollywood, just call it the land of fruits and nuts, which they do. Maybe some truth to it. When I had preachers say, are you going to go to the devil's front door? Go to a suburb. It's easier. It's cheaper to live in. And when we look at this city and we saw the skyline and when Nehemiah looked at the city and he saw the skyline and what I'm trying to get you to see is, is I'm not trying to brag about what me and my wife saw. I'm just trying to get you to see the same thing. Are you with me? I'm trying to get you to see Hollywood and LA and people not as liberals and Democrats and conservatives but as souls that need Jesus. None of those other things matter. There are people that are going to die and go to hell this year in our city. L.A. influences the entire world. Would you not agree with that? Trends in Hollywood oftentimes come 10 years before they start in the Midwest. This is a place of entertainment, a place of influence, a place of diversity, a place of incredible talent. And what could God do if revival came to Hollywood? And when we look at this area, would we not just see it as people that look differently than us, people that think differently than us, but would we see them as souls that need Jesus Christ. Nehemiah saw the need. He looked at it. He inspected it. Next, I passed by the fountain's gate and then to the king's pool. But there was no place for my mount to pass. By going up along the riverbed at night, I inspected the wall. Then I turned back so that I could enter by the valley gate and then come back again. The officials did not know where I went or what I did, so I had not yet told it to the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or any of the others who would do the work. Finally, I said to them, you see the distress that we are in? How Jerusalem is devastated and its gates are burned with fire? Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Nehemiah was given the same sermon I'm giving today. Let us see the distress of Jerusalem so that we would no more be a reproach. How about we change that Hollywood is a reproach? How about we change the fact to say, well, I'm just going to get out of California. I can't stand it anymore. How about we change that? How about we view this as a mission field? How about you view your industry as a mission field? How about you view your career as a mission field, your assets, your networks, all the different things you have in your life, view them as an opportunity for a purpose that is greater than yourself. Then I told them that the hand of God had been a good to me and also about the king's words that he had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Praise God, they had a heart to move. They didn't just sit back and have a prayer meeting. Prayer is important, but you know what they said? We're not just going to pray for a move. We're going to be the move. And church, I'm challenging you and I here today. Let's move towards that purpose. That purpose is evangelizing and reaching LA with the gospel. That's our Jerusalem. And then we're going to go to the uttermost other parts of the world to reach those as well. There's a purpose. Second word I want to give you is partnership. 
The people came together and they partnered. I don't got the time to keep on reading it, but I'll tell you right now, if you read chapter 19, or excuse me, Nehemiah chapter 2, 19 through 20, and even Nehemiah chapter 4, 1 through 6, you see this passion for work. You see this heart for work. You see mothers, children, dads, grandparents, everyone having a mind to work. And I'll tell you right now, Nehemiah could have got discouraged at times. How many of you think he probably did like all leaders? Nehemiah could have thought, man, I should have went back to the king's palace. And I just, I, I, I was having the best wine. I was in the best filet mignon. I was sleeping on the nicest bed. I had all the luxuries, ride, riding the best colt in all of the world. And I had it all. But you know what? Praise God, there was people around him to keep him encouraged. And I'll tell you right now, church, that's why you need a life group. That's why you need a community. I'll tell you right now, Frank, I know you're going through some hard times, man. You need the church. Frank lost his father. There's people in this church battling family issues. Some of you in this church right now, you're doubting the call in your life. Some of you in this church right now, you're wondering if God could really use you. And I'll tell you what you do. You need someone to get around you that's going to speak life into you. You need someone that's going to come to you and say, no, this is what the Bible says. This is what Jesus says you are. We don't pull away, we press in. The church is a beautiful thing of broken people that all need each other. You need community, you need fellowship, you need intimacy with each other. And Nehemiah had that. He had a partnership. They tackled it together. Why? Because some stones of the wall were too heavy for one man to carry alone. There needed to be a group effort. And I'll tell you right now, one thing I've seen throughout the move of God upon this church and getting this place established here at 1110 South Victory and all the lives that have been changed and all the lives that have come here and moved away. It's a very transient culture. People come and go. All the people, friends we've made of all nationalities, countries around the world. One thing I've learned is this thing is so much bigger than me. So much bigger than my wife. We fail. We drop the ball. We're not perfect because we're humans. I have my role, but you have your role. And we must continue to partner and press into each other and together reach LA with the gospel. As we cast vision, you may say, man, that seems like a lot, pastor. Yeah, but what's the price of a soul? What's the price? And hey, let's pay off some debt. Let's free up some overhead. Hey, let's get in a position to purchase. Let's get in a position to start new churches. Let's get in a better position at church. Hey, it's a lot for one person. But together, it's easy, man. Together, it's opportunity is there. Oh, there's a partnership. And then there's prayer. There's prayer. In chapter 4, 7 through 23, we see the, 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 the Jerusalem, the, the, the Jews come together as they were working. In fact, if you read it, this is an incredible war movie. Don't go home today and watch TV. Read this to your kids. Incredible war movie, okay? And they're there, and they're battling with one sword in one hand, fighting off the enemy, and with the other hammer in the other hand, building the wall. And then there's another group of them over here calling down fire from heaven. Not really, but they're praying, man. You know what that means? It takes us all doing the work. Some are going to have to pray. Some are going to have to work. Some are going to have to give. Some are going to have to bring. Listen, we're all changing at, at times. We're all doing different things here. We're all doing different parts. We're giving. We're going. We're building. We're reaching together. And we're praying, asking God to move. Some of the sweetest moments of my life and my children's life was those times of prayer right here in this building when we weren't yet moved into it. Over there at that nursery entry, right? We had a signing ceremony. And I remember we prayed with our family. My wife was great with child, all right? Big old belly, man. And it was awesome. And, uh, and uh, we were there. You were in labor. She came to prayer in labor. She knew her water broke. She came here. She was going to pray, okay? We came here. She signed her name. We, pray, we signed Corey's name on there. And then from here, we drove down to Sunset, right across from Scientology, you know, prayed over that. And then we went into the hospital, and then we had the baby. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, some of the sweetest moments is a family getting on our knees asking God to move in this place. 
People may say, man, that is a ton of money you guys raised. How in the world? I've had networks and church planning agencies reach out and say, how do you guys get a building as a young church like that? It's unheard of in LA. It's so expensive. What are you guys doing? And man, it was a move of God to move upon the hearts of people, to sacrificially give above and beyond anything we could ever imagine. And church, I'm just trying for you to see the need today. I'm trying for you to see the walls that are broken. I'm trying you to see the people that are broken. Let's stop viewing people as the color of their skin or the color of their party or, or any other preferences they have. May we see them as souls first and foremost that need Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we pray and seek God, who knows what God could do in LA? The fourth thing I want to give you this one. There's persistence. As you continue to read through chapter four, there's one thing you're going to see. Nehemiah kept on facing a battle. He kept on facing attack. He kept on facing opposition. And you know what I know right now, church? I'll be honest with you. I don't like hard times. I don't like hard times. I like happy times. Come on now. How many ever play the song, you know, there'll be happier days or whatever that song is, you know? Is that what it's called? You know, happier days. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, lyrics people. And uh, there'll be happier days. And you know what? You know, there's times where, you know what? I just want the happy days. But you know what I do know for sure? The hardest times of my life have not yet come yet. I don't think the greatest times of testing of my faith are over. At times I get scared what could be awaiting me next year. At times I get scared what God could call our family to do. But you know what I know? I know there's a good God that loves me. Amen. I know there's a God that says, Nick, I saved you in your sin. You were lost. You were headed to hell. You, were, you had no hope. I saved you. Not religion, not baptism, not trying harder. It's trusting in the gospel, the finished work of the cross of Calvary where Jesus shed his blood. And at that moment, the Lord began to break me. He began to press me. And what God has showed me over this whole experience of this church is God is more concerned with building me than he is with building a church. And every offering... In every ministry you serve in, and every time you sacrifice, God is saying, I'm building you. I'm bringing you more into Christ. At that moment where you were reached, you were reached. Now he's pressing you into the, into the conformity of Jesus Christ. He's teaching you. He's breaking you. He's ultimately turning us in to who Jesus was. Jesus loved people. Jesus gave sacrificially. And as you abide in Jesus, as you press into Jesus, the fruit of Jesus will come out of your life. And the more you're pressed into the Lord, you say, Pastor, I'm going through a real hard time right now, man. I really, I need an encouraging sermon. I don't need one of these right now, okay? Let me tell you right now, church, what you need is to press into Jesus. Press into Jesus and be persistent. Be persistent. Don't quit. And watch what he makes you become. Watch what he makes you become. Nehemiah did not quit when it got tough. Nehemiah did not give up. Nehemiah kept on going. And church, as we move forward, may we not just pray for a move of God, but may we be willing to be the move of God. On April 7th, I pray that as a church, we come together and we say, you know what? We were creative. We, 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 we let go of some things. We put some things aside. We want to become more like Christ, more extravagant. We're going to get this thing done. You say, then I'm going to go out and I'm going to reach more people. I'm going to find my calling. I'm going to pursue my purpose. I'm going to go deeper in partnership. I'm going to do more prayer. Why? Because the walls need to be reached rebuilt people need to be reached there's a city out there that is falling away who's going to reach them we are right here we are right here we are right here i'm not going to depend on no one else praise god for other works but we have a responsibility we are right here father in heaven i thank you for your word lord i thank you for the teaching in it